Hello, everyone. Do we have order in the court? Thank you. Um, my name is Bill Marimo, and um, I'm the editor of the Inquirer. And um, I wanted to welcome you to the, uh, the building that houses the Inquirer, the Daily News, and Philly.com. And um, just take maybe two minutes to introduce this program. Um, in my opinion, um, foreign news coverage um, has never been more dangerous than it is in this era, and it's never been more important. And the reason is, in my opinion, the breadth of the issues that are swirling around the world right now has never been greater, and the intensity of those issues has never been more pressurized. When you think about it, consider ISIS in the Middle East, protests in Hong Kong, which are threatening to lurch out of control, the simmering tensions of uh, perhaps warfare between Ukraine and Russia, the tenuous ceasefire in Gaza, the ongoing strife in Afghanistan, 10,000 U.S. troops still in the country, and then the Ebola outbreak in West Africa with the first case here in Dallas. So in my opinion, uh, what is happening in the world um, needs expert, incisive, analytical coverage. And that's what our panel is here to talk about tonight. Um, before we go on, I want to introduce a few Inquirer colleagues uh, with experience in world affairs. Um, Harold Jackson, where are you? Harold's the editor of our editorial page. Uh, Michael Matson, who covered the Middle East for the Inquirer. Michael, take a bow. Stand up so they can see it. Dan Rubin, who covered Berlin in Europe. And um, most importantly of all, Trudy Rubin, who of all of our uh, staffers, students, Trudy, stand up. Trudy um, has been in Syria. She's been in the world's uh, most dangerous, hottest, most newsworthy spots. And I'm sure in the course of the evening, um, you'll want to ask Trudy some questions as well as our panelists. And um, after the meeting, have a chance to talk with Trudy. So now I have a few orders of business, business before I turn things over to, to Craig. First of all, would you all silence your cell phones <laughs> and electronic devices? Equally important, we encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter by tweeting about today's program. Um, you can do that at WAC Phila, that's WAC PHILA, and at Philly Inquirer. We also invite you to like the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. So if you have your iPhone handy, you can do that now. And also the Philadelphia Inquirer on Facebook. Um, all of us here are really pleased to be partnering with the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia uh, to discuss a topic of such magnitude and gravity. And now I'd like to welcome Craig Snyder. He's the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, and um, he will introduce our panelists for this evening. Craig, oh, and I won't be here for too long because someone has to run the newsroom. <laughs> Craig, take it away. Thank, thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you for uh, co-hosting uh, with us. We're uh, delighted to be here uh, in this historic uh, and yet brand new space, a, a wonderful combination. Um, I want to start by saying that as uh, distinguished and enlightening uh, as this panel is and, and will be, uh, most of you know uh, that they weren't our first choice for, for the season. <laughs> that they, they are a, 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 somewhat, a somewhat sad, in, in all seriousness, uh, plan B. Uh, a, a number of months ago, we had confirmed as speakers for, for this date and time uh, Jason Rezian, uh, the Washington Post, a uh, Tehran correspondent, and his wife, who is also uh, a fellow journalist, uh, Yegena Salehi. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, they were uh, detained, seized, arrested, uh, one can use different words, uh, for what has happened uh, in Iran, and have been virtually uh, incommunicado uh, since then. Um, Jason uh, spoke uh, and really was a very important contributor 
uh, to two of the study tours that the World Affairs Council ran uh, in, uh, in Iran, uh, in Tehran, uh, earlier this year, uh, April and May of this year. Uh, so for us, uh, this uh, rescheduling uh, under these uh, dramatic uh, circumstances uh, moves uh, this discussion uh, from uh, the, the realm of policy in which we always operate uh, to really a much more uh, personal realm. Uh, and we will, uh, and we will ask uh, Doug uh, from the post to tell us what he can, obviously respecting uh, the delicacy of the situation, uh, but what he can about uh, about the, the, the case of uh, uh, of these two uh, fine journalists. Um, with that, let me introduce uh, our panelists uh, for uh, this evening, and I'll uh, start uh, on my on my left uh, with, with Gabriel Escobar, the managing editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Prior to this position, he served as deputy managing editor, overseeing the Inquirer's newsroom staff that covers uh, Philadelphia, the suburbs of New Jersey. He was integral uh, in developing Inquirer.com uh, and the social media linkages uh, for uh, the paper. Uh, from 2007 to 2011, uh, Gabe was the Inquirer's uh, metro editor. Uh, and he has had a distinguished career in, in journalism before coming to the Inquirer, uh, including uh, 16 years at the Washington Post, where he was a foreign correspondent covering South America. Uh, moving along, uh, uh, Doug Gell is the uh, foreign editor of the Washington Post. Uh, he oversees all news coverage outside the United States, uh, directs a staff that includes 18 reporters and 15 bureaus, as well as four editors in Washington. Until 2009, he was uh, Deputy Washington Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Uh, before becoming an editor at the Times, he spent 19 years as a reporter, filing stories from more than 40 countries. Uh, at the time, uh, at the Times, uh, Doug worked as White House correspondent, Middle East Bureau Chief based in Cairo, National Environmental Correspondent, and National Security Correspondent. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, before that he was uh, at the Los Angeles Times covering two presidential campaigns. Um, and last but uh, certainly not least, uh, Robert Mahoney is the Deputy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. He worked as a journalist in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East before joining the committee in August 2005. He reported on politics and economics for Reuters news agency from Brussels and Paris in the late 1970s from Southeast Asia in the 1980s. He covered South Asia from Delhi, reporting on the aftermath of the Indira Gandhi assassination, uh, the civil war in Sri Lanka, and the fallout from the Soviet presence in Afghanistan. In 1988, he became Reuters Bureau Chief for West and Central Africa, based in the Ivory Coast. Um, again, obviously, a, a, a most uh, relevant uh, and timely part of the world to talk about uh, now. Uh, spending considerable time in Liberia covering uh, the Civil War uh, there. Uh, so we have obviously a distinguished uh, group of journalists, uh, people who understand um, these issues of both the risks and the importance of being foreign correspondents. Um, and as Bill pointed out, um, uh, a number of other folks from the Inquirer, uh, including Trudy Rubin, who's been a long time friend uh, and, and really uh, uh, advisor in many ways of the World Stars Council, and, uh, and who is um, no stranger to these uh, most dangerous parts of the world, and we'll invite Trudy to participate in the discussion as well. So I'd like to, to uh, go in order here, ask each of our guests to make just a couple of minutes of opening remarks, uh, and then we're going to engage in a little bit of uh, Q&A uh, that I'll read, and ultimately uh, Q&A from, uh, from all of you. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, council, and thank you to the Dr. Inquirer for inviting uh, the committee to thank you for this evening. Uh, just two words about who we are. We're a group of, uh, that was founded in 1981 by journalists to work to protect journalists. And the focus of our work is largely outside the United States, uh, advocating for those journalists that don't necessarily have a voice in, uh, in those parts of the world, whether they're at risk. Um, <coughs> I need to say that, you know, the mission that we have is to look after individual journalists to begin with, and when we see these uh, terrible images of uh, journalists being beheaded, like James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, it, it really 
brings home uh, to the general public the kinds of, of risks that journalists run when they are working in repressive or conflict uh, areas. Um, I often start off these talks by really making the room really depressed by saying things like, this is probably the worst time it's ever been to be a journalist, particularly a foreign uh, correspondent. The numbers speak for this. Um, I won't bombard you with statistics, but there are now more journalists being killed every year than there has been for most of the time that the Committee to Protect Journalists has been in operation. Um, there are more than 70 journalists a year, and that's a conservative figure, that are killed in the exercise of journalism. Um, there are more than 200 journalists in jail tonight as we speak, including the ones that, uh, from the Washington Post that we've mentioned. And we've seen since the Arab uprisings of the uh, spring of 2011, an upsurge in the killings and capturing of journalists in countries which prior to that had no record of uh, journalist deaths, namely uh, Syria. Um, and there we have had something like 90 journalists taken captive since the uh, uprising, held for ransom, from held for political purposes. And tonight there are still about 20 uh, being held. Uh, so it is extremely dangerous. In fact, what has happened is there's been a perfect storm of circumstances. Uh, news organizations have shrunk their foreign bureau network uh, and freelancers have come in to fill the gap. Technology has become very cheap that has enabled many many more young people to go out to conflict zones and, and practice journalism and gather news and publish it. That was not, that was not possible a few years ago. And we had an uprising, and we had an uptick in the numbers of conflicts. And then finally, journalists themselves in some of these theaters of, of conflict have become targets. There was a time when a press pass, or particularly a, a, a European or a North American passport, was seen as a, a safety pass. It got you out of a, of a problem. Today, it gets you into trouble because a lot of these. Uh, Militias and jihadi organizations are deliberately going after Western journalists either because they see them, and this is the term that gets used a lot, it's a bit callous, but it's, it's walking ATMs, because uh, many countries are paying ransom for their journalists, and or, or they have you for a political purpose, as we saw with ISIS. So, at a time when we need journalists and journalism, we need narrative journalism more than ever to try to bring us the news and to explain the context of what's going on in all these conflict areas. The journalists that do that are the most vulnerable and they're being killed. So that, that's the perfect storm. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a great deal of good news on that, on that score. But journalists are still going out. Even though uh, Syria is dangerous, we still know that people are going inside. They're doing it quietly. And, what, and I'll, I'll end by saying that the what we as foreign journalists depend on is local journalists. We have them, we call them fixers. They're usually journalists themselves. They are your introduction into that society. They uh, introduce you to the contacts that you need for interviews. They do the translation. They, they can even do the driving. And, and they do everything that we need. And they, after we can leave, they stay behind. And they borne the brunt of, uh, of this onslaught against the press and they make up the, the, the largest toll, both in terms of uh, imprisoned and killed. Thank you. Well, I wish I could be more uplifting, um, but, I, but I'm afraid uh, it's awful difficult to, uh, to do so. I'm, I'm very proud to uh, be here in the stead of, of Jason and Yandy, but also, of course, very sad that they can't be here. And deeply troubled that after 10 weeks, uh, they were We at the Washington Post are mystified by their detention. They're accredited journalists uh, in Iran. They have uh, reputations as being uh, fair and, and, and objective. And we've been troubled by the <coughs> lack of information that's emerged about their about their detention. We heard the world heard last week from President Rouhani 
was Foreign Minister uh, Zarif in New York, that their hope that this would be resolved soon. They spoke uh, with uh, positively and offered praise of Jason and Yehi and their work, uh, said that they believed that, uh, that they hoped this would be handled, but it would remain in the hands of the, in the, hands of the judiciary. At the moment, uh, we continue to have discussions with a number of parties who are hopeful that they may. Sure, I'm sorry. It's just better. How's that? Right. I apologize. Uh, ho hopeful that they may be uh, released soon, but um, uh, it's been a very troubling episode. And one that has driven home is if we didn't need another lesson, uh, just how uh, real the dangers are uh, to reporters not just in war zones uh, uh, like Syria, where we've seen so many lives lost, but in um, places like Iran and, and North Korea and Egypt, where the dangers have also come from governments who have imprisoned journalists with very little explanation or cause. Um, I'll just say that uh, I, I agree um, with Bill uh, and with Craig that this is uh, and with Rob, that uh, there probably has been never a more dangerous time to be a journalist. As a foreign correspondent in the 90s at the New York Times, I spent a lot of time in Syria and Iran, and Iraq uh, I was based in Egypt. Um, I had my share of run-ins, but they were very minor compared to what people are seeing now. I generally felt safe in all of those countries. Uh, the world has changed in, um, in fundamental ways, in particular that part of the world. And the, the tragedy and the difficulty is that we, we never need, we, never, we are very much in need of understanding and explanation of what's happening. The events are consequential, that's why the dangers are so great. Um, and to find a way to be on the ground, as the Washington Post is committed to doing around the world, and particularly in these parts of the world where what's unfolding matters so much, um, is vitally important. But um, the, uh, the stakes are huge. Um, as, as Craig said, I was a foreign correspondent, and like Doug, it was a different time. And, uh, you know, what the few experiences that I had were uncomfortable and nothing approaching uh, the journalist face now. Um, in fact, I was telling somebody a few minutes ago that I felt far more threatened and menaced when I was a PC crime reporter in the nation's capital. And the only time that I was seriously threatened with arrest was by homicide detectives working for the District of Columbia. <laughs> so I'd like to spend my, my few minutes talking about another group of journalists. These are journalists who are working in their own country, where Western reporters face danger, and they, these, foreign, these reporters in their own country, are also menaced. The plight for both is the same. A reporter in the exercise of his or her craft faces great obstacles and often great danger. The difference, of course, is that for these native reporters, the menace is literally homegrown and familiar. For 17 years, a foundation established in honor of a Colombian journalist who was a casualty of his country's drug wars has awarded an annual prize to a reporter whose work put him or her in danger. The award is announced always on May 3rd which is World Press Freedom Day, as declared by the United Nations. Based on our review of the winners, to be so honored means that you, as a journalist, were imperiled for what we often take for granted here, just reporting. There are apparently no shortage of candidates for this annual $25,000 award, and that's why this forum is so important. In case you missed it, then I did, the 2014 winner of the Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize is Ahmed Seek, a Turkish investigative journalist who was jailed in 2011. He was released after a year and is currently awaiting trial on charges that could result in a 15-year sentence if he's convicted. He was arrested just before he published the book on Fethullah Gulen, a controversially mom and founder of a Turkish Muslim movement that, among other things, has established charter schools around the world. He is in exile 
oddly, in Sandlersburg, Pennsylvania, where he has a charter school. Here's what Guillermo Cano's widow <clears throat> said in awarding the prize. Ahmed Sikh, she said, represents many journalists who are being followed, jailed, judged in unfair trials, sentenced or assassinated for defending the power of the word and the search for truth. Now, do you think it's comforting for Ahmed Sikh and his endangered colleagues to learn that there is and has been for many years something called, this is the official title, the United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity, full title. Hard to say how much comfort that security plan provides, but at the very least, it's a reminder to all of us that this issue is taken seriously. Unfortunately, that plan, the plan was fully in place in 2013 when six journalists were assassinated. And that was only in the Americas. The death toll, three Brazilians, two Mexicans, one Paraguayan. In the Americas alone, according to the Inter-American Press Association, more than 400 journalists have been killed or disappeared since 1988, which is when this grisly count was first tabulated. Colombia leads with 127, Guillermo Cano being probably the most prominent. Mexico, where violence against journalists has been especially severe lately, is second with 115. Third is Brazil with 46. It's worth noting that all these countries are democracies. The numbers tell at the awful human toll, but what's the impact journalistically? The obvious and caustic effect is reflected in the reporting itself. When journalists are targeted, and when these crimes go unsolved and unpunished, which is the rule and not the exception, reporting itself is undermined. The violence and the threat of violence distorts reality, fosters fear, and ultimately results in self-censorship, even in democracies. And that is its own grave danger. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, Trudy if you wanted to uh, make some comments. Yeah, we have a, there's a microphone coming up. Thank you. I, yeah, I just uh, would like to make a couple of comments about uh, the coverage of Syria. Uh, given that the United States is now bombing in Syria, it becomes more important than ever for people to have some idea of what is going on there. And there are two particular um, situations there that I wanted to talk about. One is the fact that given that most U.S. newspapers are shrinking, if not eliminating their foreign coverage, and that it is the rare newspaper now that has bureaus abroad, and I thank the Philadelphia Inquirer for keeping me in a travel budget because there are not many regional papers that send anyone to troubled places. The result of this has been what was mentioned is a surge in freelance journalists. What this means is that you have brave, sometimes foolhardy, people going into Syria with no war zone insurance, with no backup, trying sometimes to prove themselves but not knowing any of the rules of the road. I've talked often with my colleagues about how different it was for us, uh, not just because, for example, in covering the Lebanese Civil War in the 80s, even if you were captured by a militia or by the PLO, um, you usually could say, take me to your leader. In Syria, there aren't necessarily any leaders, and those leaders might not be interested in talking to you. And so it's almost immoral, I believe, for publications in the United States, some of which have money, to be using the work of freelancers who get paid a pittance and have absolutely no staff backup, no insurance should they get badly injured or killed. 
Um, I will say a word here about, I probably shouldn't, it's talking out of school, but the organization that at one point employed Jim Foley, Global Post, um, their top executive has been talking at length about how they made such a great effort and great cost to get him back, and they did. However, uh, reporters for Global Post who are over in terribly dangerous situations do not get war zone insurance. And often you get freelancers going over there who cannot even afford bulletproof vests, who never get any training in how to behave in a war zone. Uh, the reason that Robert Sotloff was taken and others is because they did not have um, colleagues who were trustworthy, who had experience, to whose fixers or drivers they could talk in order to get a reliable fixer or translator for themselves to go in. And they took a chance and hired people who were not vetted and then were shopped, S-H-O-P-P-E-D, for money by the people that they had relied on to transport them. So we are in a new situation where foreign coverage in dangerous places may be done largely by people who are getting paid almost nothing and are at terrible risk. And I think publications, including some online publications which have money, have to think seriously about their responsibility to the new breed of freelancer who is really going out there with any, without anyone to protect their back. The other thing that I would like to mention, um, there, it was mentioned up here, the brave role that local fixers, translators, and journalists play, and they, they are the ones who get left behind and are terribly vulnerable. But there is one category of local journalists that I want to mention because I think it's a category to whom the United States government has a deep responsibility, and I hope that it will take up that responsibility. That is the citizen journalists in Syria. Just today, the Syrian Organization for Human Rights released a report of citizen journalists who have died in Syrian prisons and be, been tortured to death. And when you take a look at the photographs of these brave young men, in this case, it was all men, young men. It's enough to make you burst into tears because these are all young men who were students or young professionals and they stayed in places like Homs and Aleppo in order to report, and here's the catch, often they were reporting with equipment given to them by the United States video cams, satellite phones, because although the United States was not willing to arm moderate opposition, of which there was some two or three years ago, they were willing to train citizen journalists who would come out across the border into Turkey, be put up in hotels in Istanbul, and be trained to use this equipment and would go back. So in essence, these young people were filming the massacre of their fellow civilians and often paying with their lives, uh, and some are still rotting in prisons or being tortured to death. And it does seem to me that this is a cause that US journalists should take up because those who have survived, many of them have had to get out to cities in Turkey where they are basically making a living or trying to figure out how they are going to live. And I think that anyone who was trained as a citizen journalist with U.S. equipment and risked their lives to send back reports, which we have looked at like voyeurs, while they may have been tortured to death, anyone who has survived uh, deserves a U.S. visa. And believe me, U.S. visas for Syrians to resettle in this country are almost impossible to get. So I raise the issue of Syria's citizens, journalists, and because that human rights report came out today and it is heartbreaking and more of them will be tortured to death but some will survive and we owe them the right to resettle here. And I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much Trudy and our, and our panel. I want to uh, to a, a little bit of conversation uh, before opening to questions uh, from the floor. Um, and part of the, part of the role 
that I like to play in, in World Affairs Council programs is uh, call it devil's advocate. Um, but but I want to I want to ask uh, some questions that uh, that, uh, that are provocative uh, and see what you all have to say and really sort of pick up on some of the things that, that Trudy and the panel said about this new era of freelance journalism. Um, so let me pose the question first in kind of the starkest, I mean, almost cartoonish kind of form. There is an argument that some have, that I've heard some make, kind of in a closeted form, that says that uh, James Foley and, and Stephen Sokoloff uh, essentially started a war. That they, they went into a place that they shouldn't have been, uh, put themselves at risk, but more than put themselves at risk, uh, ended up, because of the, of the horrific drama of these videos, uh, being pawns, perhaps perfect pawns, for the ISIS strategic plan to become public enemy number one of the American military. Um, ISIS gloats, obviously, over these killings. Uh, they gloat over the fact that they've now become uh, the baddest terrorists in the world from America's point of view. So in a sense, the, 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 question, the question is, are these freelancers perhaps doing more harm than good? Shall I start? Please. <laughs> uh, there are so many false premises in that argument that I can't really begin. Um, but I'll just say they did not start a war. The war was going on before they ever got there. ISIS was kidnapping and capturing people before they ever got there. And ISIS was an enemy of the United States before they got there, even if the United States didn't take it as seriously as, seriously as it might have done. Uh, those young men and women go there because um, they want to report, they want to bear witness, they want to write or record what's going on. It's a, it's, 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 it's a noble impulse. It's what we all on the panel do and have done in our lives. Um, the fact that they are being uh, used as propaganda, that's a, that's a slightly different question, but that doesn't uh, in any way call into question their motives for going there. Because what they were doing was trying to bring us, and they did bring us, a nuance and a fair uh, report and, and, and understanding of what was happening. Uh, when those videos then appeared, uh, there were debates within newsrooms about whether to show video, about whether to show uh, uh, stills uh, grabbed from the video, and that was an editorial judgment, and most uh, organizations have not uh, shown the video, particularly the grisly parts of it, because they don't want to be seen or actually just be a tool for, for propaganda. But if uh, James Foley had not gone to Syria, we would have been deprived of a lot of news. He also went to Libya, um, and he went to other places in the Middle East. And so you know, he was doing us a service. Uh, he wasn't doing us a disservice. I, I agree uh, that, that James and Stephen were doing a service, but I also agree with, with Trudy we're doing a service without the backing and support uh, of news organizations that they were entitled to. And I think their stories, and before that, the detention of Austin Tice, who was doing work for the Washington Post and McClatchy, uh, have reminded us uh, that the dangers are more real than I think we envisioned two years ago, and that they do bring with them a responsibility to take steps to, to maintain the security of our correspondence. Most news organizations, including the Post, for more than two years have generally now not accepted work from freelancers from Syria, not uh, commissioned freelancers to go, to go into Syria, have believed that anyone who's working for uh, us ought to go in with the full backing and protection and resources of the, uh, of the news organization. It's a difficult choice to make, as Rob points out. The knowledge that that uh, the, uh, that the reporting from Syria, that this emerged from the reporting from Syria, is vital. We never want to shut down or stifle uh, um, the, the flow of information. We've continued to send reporters into Syria when we feel that it's safe. But I think we, and I know that other senior editors and other newspapers have felt the same thing believe that we need to be sure that we're not providing an incentive 
for young journalists without the support and training and equipment that they need to take foolhardy uh, risks. Um, I agree. I, you would hope that uh, you know their news organizations would have uh, told them before and often reminded them when they were on the ground there that you know their primary uh, objective was to be safe, right? I mean, your, the personal safety of the journalist is something that managers have to emphasize all the time, particularly in situations like this when when they face a combat situation. It isn't the story is never worth your own life for your own security. And I think editors have a responsibility, particularly the ones dealing with them, reporters uh, on a daily basis, to remind them. Reporters unwittingly can place themselves in danger. Um, and I don't know enough about the circumstances leading up to each of these instances. But they were in a dangerous situation. And at the end, you know, I think based on, you know, what their mission was, which was really report, you know, they, at that point, they were essentially every journalist landing in a place, hostile in this case, doing his job. Uh, let, let me follow this line just one more step. Um, Edward R. Murrow reported from one, not from Berlin, there was no expectation in an earlier generation that we would have reporters on the ground, essentially, uh, within the enemy. Um, the conversation that we're having here, part of the premise of it, is that, uh, as Trudy said, we're, we're bombing in Syria. Therefore, we need information from journalists on the ground in Syria. If you look at, at, at the World War II meta, maybe that's uh, exactly the wrong time for there to be uh, U.S. journalists on the ground. If, if the United States, that is to say, American journalists on the ground, if the United States is engaged in military action, uh, that clearly puts those people at risk. So, I mean, I guess my question is, uh, why is the historical reference why is the fact that there were no Americans writing from Berlin or Tokyo? Why is that not relevant to what we're saying? Uh, well, I, there were foreign journalists in Japan and in Germany, um, and some of them were killed. I mean, I remember there was, there was one correspondent thrown out of a window in Tokyo. Uh, there were. There have always, always been reports from the other side. During the Cold War, we have non-aligned countries who have reporters in the Soviet bloc. Um, access was often controlled. Uh, you might be stuck in Moscow, or you might be stuck in, in the capital, and Saddam ran in Iraq. It was very difficult and very expensive to get visas, but people did go in. I think you can't tell half a story. You have to go um, and uh, see for yourself what's going on when that's possible. I mean, even during the first uh, Iraq war, uh, CNN managed to stay inside Baghdad and during reports of the, uh, the, uh, the, first, the first bombings uh, that took place there in, in 1991. Um, I, think, I think we would be blind uh, in one eye if we did not have people on the other side, and then that would allow the government, whether it's our government or their government, to control the narrative. And we know how, how that ends. Um, please. We are, uh, uh, I think sometimes we, we do in this generation, this era though, uh, underestimate um, uh, the, the risks that, um, that, that accompany being in a place where the United States is engaged in, in military action. Um, but the need to, uh, to be on the ground and to get that kind of understanding um, is, you know, is been driven home, I think, by the events of the last 20 years. I was telling someone as we started that when I went to Cairo in 1995, I um, was kind of at a watershed in terms of how American newspapers approached the, mm -hmm. approached the world. I was told by an Apco and foreign editor that I really didn't need to study any Arabic because anybody I wanted to speak with spoke English anyway. Um, and was told by an incoming foreign editor, fortunately, that, well, it funds America, and maybe I could have six weeks. But, uh, but but there had there had been a, a sense I think that um, and, and I think it was certainly was part of the attitude in, in, in at the time of the, of the Second World War that there's an us against them uh, that we don't really need to be talking to them too much because we understand how they how they think. 
And I think the, the, the lack of knowledge of, uh, about the Middle East in particular that has become evident over the last, last 15 or 20 years has driven home the importance of, of being there when it's possible to do so. And I think Craig is right in the sense that, uh, you know, in the World War II, the reporters, you know, rode with the Army and they were part of the general staff and they advanced as the Army advanced. You know, in this case, the nature of war uh, has changed. Um, Carol Murphy of the Washington Post in the first Iraq war stayed after the bombing and remained there for three months, if I remember correctly, um, and then snuck out her dispatches. Um, and, you know, ran the risk that a lot of people are running now. Uh, so, but, but I do agree, it, it's, it's a relatively new development. And part of it is that you know, the theater of war has sort of changed. Um, and then, you know, enemy and, and foe conquered territory, uh, territory to be conquered is, you know, down the block. And, and the whole sort of situation is very volatile. I just add, add one point. I mean, if you take the analogies of the Second World War, those, those were formal wars by nation states that declared as wars, right? And now we're dealing with militias, we're dealing with civil wars, we're dealing with criminal gangs and drug wars in Mexico or whatever. These are informal wars. Often the front lines are very fluid. Um, the, the, even the, um, if you embed yourself with a commander and that person's protection, they can't always, they can't always uh, protect you. So journalists in those situations don't even have that kind of formal protection that you get when you embed. And just one other point, you can embed with military forces, but there are very strict rules about what you can report from that, and you only get to see what they want you to see. And, you know, the, um, the, the journalists that didn't embed with either of the two Iraq invasions by the United States were running around in great danger of their own lives, but they felt compelled to tell a story from a different perspective than they were. Um, and there's one other thing I just wanted to add, uh, which was we're talking a lot about conflict, but all our research shows that most journalists are not killed in conflict zones. They're, they're conflict zones, they are murdered, they're targeted for their work. Most of them are local journalists, they're covering things like corruption, and they are killed because of what they're reporting uh, deliberately, not because they're caught in crossfire. Uh, sticking, sticking with the issue of, of U.S. Orders. Um, what do you all believe is the responsibility of the United States government, whether it's in the case uh, like Jason uh, or uh, in, in, in the cases we saw with, with ISIS? We know that there was an attempted military rescue uh, that apparently was, 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 obviously was unsuccessful. Um, these are American citizens, um, and yet they have volunteered, as we've said, to be in dangerous places. What do you see as the role, the responsibility of the United States government to try to get back captives or detainees, whether through diplomatic or, or military means? I guess I would argue that, that, the, that the obligation is the same as it would be to any U.S. citizen. I don't, I don't think it's our place to insist that journalists uh, pursue a, a, a higher calling or that we have a greater right on the resources of the, mm -hmm. of, of the U.S. government to, uh, to come to our defense. That said, we've been uh, hardened in Jason's case, and in the case of Austin Tice, and in the case of other journalists who were detained to hear the United States speak about the importance of their, of their being released. The question of rescues of, uh, of, of ransoms uh, are clearly, clearly complicated ones, uh, uh, enormously complicated. Um, it's hard to generalize in terms of what the right approach uh, ought, ought to be in, in, in each situation. Uh, it involves, I, I think, it ought to involve, in the case of ransoms and, and rescues, consultation with, with families and, and, and news organizations, which, which doesn't always take place. There certainly have been cases in which attempts to rescue journalists or attempts to rescue other U.S. citizens have put those individuals in greater danger than they would otherwise have been. There, there are clear uh, implications for the government because, as Doug said, these are American citizens or held by a hostile force. So, you know, it's natural for the, uh, for the government to get involved. You know, it becomes a little more complicated in, in other situations that are somewhat like this, but out of the theater of war. Um, 
drug lords in South America and in Colombia and in Ecuador in particular, you know, have kidnapped oil workers for 20 years, and it's widely known that, um, you know, that the oil companies pay. Um, you know, would you say the same thing for media companies? Well, that becomes a, a whole other issue. So that's the, the next and the final question that I want to ask before opening to the audience is about is, is on the issue of race. So the president uh, very dramatically chaired uh, the session of the U.S. Security Council last week uh, and got a unanimous vote uh, regarding the, the, the effort to create a, a universal global system on the, uh, that restricts the ability of the ISIS fighters to return to, to other countries. Should there be an effort to have a global protocol that says don't pay ransom so as not to encourage further kidnapping? Well, um, the position is this, that at one of the last, I think it was the last G8 summit, that the, the British Prime Minister uh, had uh, assurances from all the countries around the table that they would not pay ransom. And then we saw a number of European countries hostages released, and the New York Times and others have done extensive reporting on this, and they concluded that those countries, despite their public commitments, paid ransom to get tourists, journalists and, and aid workers released from North Africa and the Middle East. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a disconnect between what countries say and what, what they do. But it is, uh, I think, well known that the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and, and some other countries do not pay ransom. Um, we don't condone paying of ransom, but we understand that relatives will do anything to get their loved ones back. And we know that, you know, uh, People have, have, have taken out second mortgages, have, had, have sought uh, money from benefactors, anything to get the money together, not only to pay a ransom, but even to pay the security companies that they need to advise them on how to handle this. So the situation is a mess. And what, uh, what, are, what people are calling for now is, is some clarity and some reporting on the situation and to bring them out of this kind of opaque area where this whole issue lies into some, into some transparency because if you look at the, the effects of this, you had James Foley held in the same room as European captives who were freed and he was killed. <coughs> it, it is absolutely a, a model picture and while I agree with, with Rob and with the premise that um, governments ought not to pay ransom and agree with the, with the United States and Britain with their position. I also believe it would be unrealistic and simply impossible to enforce a prohibition on the, on the paying of ransom. And I believe that the U.S. position, uh, which is so strongly against the paying of ransom, has confused families um, who, uh, in most cases, actually are legally uh, able to pay these kinds of ransoms, but, are, but have been told that they um, and uh, the, the need for clarity there is, is particularly important to those who, again, feel acutely the, the need to bring loved ones back. Watch the examples of others who have who have been whose freedom has been obtained by the by the paying of rents, <coughs> and yet have been been told by the United States government that that's something they should not do. I, I agree. I mean, well, put yourself in the position of a family, you know that may have the resources or struggle but would get the resources to pay a ransom uh, and then, you know, face that difficult situation where your own government is telling you no and then you know that there are instances where other governments have paid and that this is, you know, the only way to save your family member. It's an impossible situation. Trudy, anything to add? stand depends on where you sit and obviously um, if it was my relative I'd move heaven or earth and I'd hate the government for not doing it. One thing that I can say, on the other hand I understand that if you do it more get taken, but one thing one can say without equivocation is we have a track record now where it seems that the State Department 
is either callous or inept in dealing with families of hostages. And we have seen it over and over again. And to me, it is simply unacceptable, and it has a long history. I mean, I've been around long enough so that a friend of mine's father was kidnapped by a Lebanese militia. He was the president of American University of Beirut, David Dodge. He was kidnapped and he was transported secretly to Iran. His family, and Nina Dodge, his daughter, was the Quaker representative in Jerusalem at the time, and I was the Middle East correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. And Nina and I used to sit and hatch tremendous plots on how we were going to rescue her father. I had all these Shiite connections and the Bakar Valley and yada yada. Fortunately, we didn't do anything nutty. But the point of this, and he amazingly was released after a year. But the point was that the State Department back then, in 1981, was not communicating with the family. They were being kept in the dark, and it continues until today. And to me, this is the inexcusable part. Not only do the government of Europe, governments of European countries communicate, they, they pay ransoms, but, but at least they communicate. And that is something that the United States could do without violating principles. And, and I think perhaps more fuss should be made about that by newspapers and journalistic support organizations. So I'd like to uh, open it up for uh, questions from the audience. And uh, we have a roving mic that's going to come around. Thank you. Um, first on, the, on this ransom issue, um, ransoms get, get handled in strange ways. I mean, we all talk about paying off uh, from the U.S., but more times than not, it's handled by some third party. And you never know about it. It sort of happens. And this is, uh, this is the way of the world. And, and what you see is not always what you get. What I would like to comment on was sort of follow up on the, on the messages of this evening of, of basically um, mayhem and, and, um, and freelance reporting and the introductions of new technologies to ask the panel the question of, is there a need for a fundamental shift in the uh, reporting model that has traditionally been used? Now, do we need to have uh, 25 people at a news conference to hear what's being said? It seems to me that the value of reporting comes with analysis. It comes with bits and pieces of data that come from various and sundry sources that these that reporters are able to dig up, and the value really comes in the analysis, the, the kludging together of all that data. That says to me that, that the real value might be in having the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and, and a variety of other newspapers to have people working in concert with one another to piece together those uh, tidbits, to come up with what's needed for that overall analysis and contribute more, if you will, to the public knowledge and public welfare. I don't think that makes any sense. It's hard to conceive of that as being sort of an organizing concept for reporting. The truth is that there is an ad hoc version of this, because journalists, particularly in situations where they are under threat, cluster together. I mean, it's in the nature of the beast in some ways. Uh, and then some of what you described you're gathering information together. Uh, there's far more sharing there than there would be in the halls of Capitol Hill, for example. But, but you're, you're right, the technology has, cha has changed some things, and we've all recognized slowly that there is less need for us to do things that are redundant, duplicative of what others are doing. You'll see fewer people sitting in the White House briefing room now than ever before because they're watching it piped in on, uh, elsewhere. Uh, what I wouldn't accept, and I, I don't think you're, you're arguing, uh, is that technology uh, means that all we need to do is sit back in the newsroom and assemble the information that flows in, that flows in and, and, and make decisions. The fact that the technology allows us to see places we haven't been doesn't mean that it gives us an omniscient knowledge of the world. We still need to be out there, we still need to be on the ground reporting so that the analysis, so that the analysis we're producing is as fine and on point and accurate as it possibly can 
Yeah, I mean, underneath all this, don't forget, the news business is a competitive news, is a competitive industry. And um, your, your reporters are very, very competitive, so they're going to go. You have already things called pools, where, where it's difficult to go somewhere. Uh, there are organized pools where one journalist will go and share that information with others. That's been going on for many, many years. You have informal pools in very dangerous situations sometimes. Like this happened in the Balkans and in Sarajevo, where in order to reduce the, the risk of, of, of camera crews being sniped, they would they informally you know, shared footage, and one crew would go out and get it and share it with the others. And that, that, that happened kind of uh, amongst the journalists themselves. So this does happen. But you, will, you would be the poorer as a reader or a viewer if only uh, a, few, a few people were allowed to uh, witness uh, events. And you, you mentioned the press conference, and that's the one place where there'll never be any news. So. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I want to say when it comes to foreign correspondence, uh, except in Israel, I don't think press conferences are something that they spend a lot of time doing. And often these days, um, the intelligence agencies learn their stuff by reading the news reports from foreign correspondents because there's a hell of a lot of stuff that they either are not doing or seem to be incapable of doing. And if you didn't have correspondents out there, there'd be a lot less information flowed in the public. Thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about the Middle East, we've talked about Latin America, we haven't talked about Russia and Ukraine. I wonder if you might, in, in that situation, it seems like maybe even the, gov the government is, is knocking off the journalists. Um, could you talk about the situation that journalists are facing there and, and how you view um, their safety and, and the situation in general? Ukraine's been a, been a very dangerous place, and, and, and you're right, sometimes our fixation on the dangers of the, of the Middle East, speaking for myself in particular, causes us to, um, to be surprised by the we're finding in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, journalists have been, have been killed, uh, they've been detained at, at checkpoints and uh, continue to face uh, very difficult circumstances. It's required um, uh, people to find new ways of, of, of approaching the, the job, often to work with, with translators when they're operating in eastern Ukraine and, and who are of Russian nationality or even have Russian passports because those are the only ones who uh, are seen as, as credible. Um, American journalists in particular, I think, have had a, have had a difficult um, uh, time, a more difficult time than, than Europeans. It's another place where I'd spent time in the past, um, not long after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, while it was a place full of sort of despair and uncertainty, I never felt, um, never felt threatened. And that's uh, certainly not the case for, for many correspondents who have spent weeks and weeks in some very dangerous circumstances this year. Yeah, I think it's important to understand the, the bigger context too, which is that Russia is fast becoming an incredibly repressive place for journalists. I mean, since Putin first came to power in 2000, at least 20 Russian journalists have been killed, murdered. Um, and the Soviet, that's uh, sorry, Excuse me. The Russian, <laughs> the, the, the Russian, I'm going to say it's almost like the Soviet Union, in that Putin has basically closed down the most independent media outlets, uh, broadcast media in particular, television. You will not get the other side, if you're a Russian watching TV, you will not get the other side of the conflict in Ukraine. But then again, you won't know what's really going on in your own country too, as the natural resources and wealth of the country is flooded by the friends of, of, of Vladimir Putin. So that, that's the context that, in which you see. And on the other side, in Ukraine, I mentioned how local journalists bear the brunt of, uh, of the, uh, the repression. Going back to the 90s, there was a beheading of a Ukrainian journalist called Gregory Gongadze, who, whose wife uh, couldn't even find his body for many years. He had uh, upset uh, the, uh, the, the Ukrainian government. So on both sides, the picture from the journalist's point of view is it is one of repression and, and danger. We have time for uh, one more question. I saw a hand in the back. Where, you know what? Well, okay, we'll do this one, then we'll do one for one of our students. Okay. 
Nick Boyd's Evanston Ministry School in Bryn Mawr. I was wondering if any or all of you were able to share your... Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was wondering if you were able to share your views on the Islamic State's usage for propaganda purposes, if you will, of British correspondent John Cantley. Islamic State has used the, the videos uh, of the beheadings of journalists as well as the, the clearly forced testimonies and, and, and confessions um, has been um, obviously awful and, uh, and, and troubling but in some ways not surprising. It's part of a, a pattern of the way groups like this have, have behaved for a long time. It does raise questions for all of us about what it is that you broadcast and what it is that you, uh, that you don't. Um, uh, it raises questions about the degree to which you, you name journalists who are in, in captivity and, um, and or, or, or whether you don't. The whole question of blackouts on, uh, on, on whether uh, citizens are being detained <coughs> is, is, is an extremely complicated one. Um, so it's one we, we, we wrestle with every day. Um, but because it's propaganda, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's not news, and I generally believe that whether you air the footage or, or not, we certainly should be reporting on it. it. It does add insight to the way this group is behaving. Yeah, I would just say, um, what, what ISIS is doing with that video, of course, is disgusting. I mean, these are civilians. Uh, and they're being coerced into making statements. Uh, but it's not just ISIS that have done this. Um, to bring it back to Iran, uh, journalists are forced to confess uh, to crimes that they've not committed on state TV, often in Iran. Uh, the Chinese have done the same thing in the past. So um, this is a technique which is being used by governments as well now as by militias. The difference being that with the states, those uh, journalists weren't under threat of death, um, and we've seen what ISIS is capable of since August. Okay, truly, truly last question. We have uh, one over here from one, another of our students. Hello, I'm Michelle from Bodine um, for International Affairs. And my question for you, um, knowing we have advanced technology and satellite equipment, to what extent is international journalism journalism on the ground is an effective means to gather data of, certain, of current situations going on in these countries, considering the critical danger and risk one plunges into when they set foot on the ground? Thank you. Good summary. <laughs> So is, is your question, how does it help you? Um, mainly, like, how does it help international journalists, uh, potential or current journalists? How does it help current or potential journalists? Uh, well, it should be a number of caution, right? I mean, that, that's the first thing, is that it really does emphasize the great peril that you could face. You know, at the same time, you know, there are journalists who are there now who are reporting, uh, who have had, you know, to report on these horrific assassinations and are still there. So, to you, to your question, I would say that you should be greatly encouraged that there are people with such valor that even under these circumstances, they are still there. Okay, great last word. I want to thank uh, our panel, I want to thank Trudy.